And then, so here we go. Welcome everyone tonight to our webinar on tips for backyard wildfire resiliency. My name is Ashley McFarland with Dovetail Partners and I'm your host tonight. So I'm going to um, stay in the room and just help troubleshoot if anyone's having any problems, but it looks like everyone was able to get on fairly easily. Uh, just a few things with Zoom. Um, you are more than welcome to have your video on, but especially if you're a little worried about your internet connectivity, you can go ahead and turn that video off down in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. There's a little button that says stop video. You can turn that on and off um, at your pleasure. And then there's also the mute button and it looks like everyone's doing a great job at keeping that muted for now, which is excellent. It does help so that we don't get a bunch of feedback and background noise. Um, and we're gonna try to stay on mute for the majority of the presentation. And then at the very end, we may go ahead if we've got some time to take that off and do a little bit of Q&A live. Um, if you have any questions about anything um, or have not only technical questions, but just questions for our presenters, I highly suggest you drop those questions in the chat pod. We're going to have a few breaks as we go through tonight. And so we'll be able to, I'll be able to pull some of those questions out of the chat box and ask the presenters for you so we can get some of those questions answered in real time. So um, finally, if right now you're seeing a whole lot of um, people's faces, their videos, um, in the top left-hand corner where you're seeing everyone's video, there's a couple options where you can um, click on those buttons. There's a square and then there's like two rectangles and then a grid of nine boxes. Those are just different view options. And I would actually suggest clicking on just the individual square, which should be the second option. That's going to just always show the video of the person that's talking. Which, is, which for me at least tends to be a little less um, kind of distracting when I'm watching a presentation. So if you go ahead and click on that, that'll kind of minimize how many things you're viewing all at once. So with that, I would love to just go ahead and turn it over to Gloria Erickson. Hi everyone, um, welcome uh, to Tips for Backyard Wildfire Resiliency. As Ashley said, my name is Gloria Erickson and I also work for Dovetail Partners. Um, I am the Community Wildfire Project Manager and I am also the contracted St. Louis County FireWise Coordinator. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so these are our webinar partners and um, we, all thank you very very much for joining us this evening especially since it's such a beautiful evening here in the north country um if that's where you're from um i want you all to settle in and relax get comfortable not too comfortable we don't want you to fall asleep but um again as ashley pointed out everyone will be on mute during the presentation but we will have breaks um for asking questions and if a question does come up, um, go ahead and put it in the chat box and we'll get to it um, when we have that break. So again, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, many of you on the call might be from Minnesota, but some of you uh, are not. So I wanted you to know that um, myself and my webinar partners are from the state of Minnesota. And we all live and work in the area that we commonly call the Arrowhead region of, of Minnesota. Um, the Arrowhead region is a lot of beautiful boreal forests and, and lakes. And um, with that comes wildfire. So we are very aware of the wildfire danger up here. Um, but that being said, the information that you will be hearing tonight is applicable to any place where there is a wildfire prone area. Next slide. So this virtual presentation is a little bit different than what we usually do. Um, what we do usually in the summertime is we actually host what we call Firewise Tips um, at a private property. Um, the landowner hosts it and we invite their neighbors over and we have beverages and snacks and we introduce ourselves and then we actually walk around the property and um, we look at different things that people can do and we demonstrate some of those things to show people the things they can do to help their properties be more resilient to wildfire. So 
Unfortunately, we're still advised not to have large groups. And so that's why we decided to try this virtual webinar. Um, and it's getting really nice outside. All of us are kind of stuck at home. So it's a good time to get out there and uh, start doing some of these things around our home to help them be more resilient to wildfire. Next slide. So who are we? As I mentioned, uh, my name is Gloria Erickson and I am the Community Wildfire Project Manager for a nonprofit, Dovetail Partners Incorporated, and the St. Louis County Firewise Coordinator. Um, I am a resident of Ely, Minnesota, and Ely is located approximately 60 miles as the crow flies from the Canadian border. And we're on the edge, or one edge, of the Boundary Waters Canoe Wilderness area. Uh, Ely's population is approximately 3,400 people, um, we, but we also have um, townships around us and um, a lot of permanent and seasonal homeowners live here. And we live in, again, like I said, a beautiful forest with lots of lakes. Um, in fact, that's why I moved here 21 years ago. Um, I was all starry-eyed about living in the woods. Um, but at that time, uh, you know, I didn't completely understand what that meant and what responsibility it is to live in the woods. But I'm learning. I'm learning every day about different ways to keep my forest healthy. And also, choosing to live in the woods, I realize that also the danger of wildfire is always here. And so I'm learning actions that I can take around my property to have a better chance of riding out a wildfire. And those actions can also reduce the risk to my local firefighters, who a lot of them are, are very close friends of mine. So for the past six years, I've been working with local residents and landowners on identifying and implementing the actions they can take on their property to be more resilient to wildfire. I also work with communities on strategic planning for before, during, and after wildfire. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jeff Jackson. Okay, I got it here. All right, uh, hey everyone, my name is Jeff. I am uh, a forester and a wildland firefighter with the state of Minnesota. I've been doing this for about 16 years now. Um, and uh, being a wildland firefighter, I've gotten to see a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. I've seen the kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and um, I look forward to uh, getting the chance to hopefully uh, impart some wisdom about uh, creating defensible space around your structures and on your property. And uh, Todd? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, Todd Armbruster. I'm the Cook and Lake County Firewise Coordinator. And I grew up um, coming to the family cabin outside of Ely um, and working at local resorts up there. Um, I've been a wildland firefighter on the Superior National Forest in the past. And I've been the Cook County Firewise Coordinator about five and a half years. Um, I've been with Lake County for about two and a half years. And similar to Gloria, I work with uh, communities on wildfire resiliency mitigation projects, um, educational outreach, and looking forward to working with all of you. And uh, next we have Ryan Miller with Vermilion Community College. Hey everybody, I'm Ryan. I currently am an instructor at, uh, uh, natural resources instructor at Vermilion Community College. Uh, prior to that, I've been a wildland firefighter. I started as a wildland firefighter in 2005 and uh, worked for a couple different state agencies in the Midwest and out uh, in the Northwest, Idaho and Montana, mostly. Uh, moved back here and recently accepted a position at uh, Vermilion Community College. I started there in 2020 and got about half a semester in uh, before we went to remote learning. So it's, it's been an interesting year and uh, happy to be here with you all tonight. Thanks everyone. So now you know who we are, we would like to know who you are. So you'll see a polling question on your screen and we ask all of you to, to click what uh, best describes who you are. And you can pick, pick more than one. 
and then hit the submit button so we can all see. Going to leave it open until I see a majority of folks have voted. We're about halfway there. So thanks for giving us your responses. It helps our speakers too to kind of know who they're talking to. And Ashley, it looks like we might have some uh, like green drawing on the screen. I don't know if you're able to lock that down or. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to see on the next slide um, what that looks like. Right. Not everybody, but a majority of folks have voted. So I will go ahead and end the poll and then share the results out. Oh, look at that. Good. All right. That's exciting. So 42% the majority are rural woodland property owners. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and part of Firewise community. I know we recognized a couple of you when you were coming on. This is very, very exciting. And agency people, city, city people with a backyard. And I love the long, lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> and what well, did we have? Did we have someone put something in the chat? Yeah, we've got some people mentioning where they're coming from and representing. We've even got some people from Michigan DNR, um, uh, NFPA, pro someone from the NFPA Firewise USA program with us tonight. Uh, we've got a suburban fire chief in Minnesota. And we've got Annie Schmidt, our liaison with the Fire Adaptive Communities Network with us tonight. All she's, right. Well, yeah, welcome. she's in Washington State, so thank you. Very exciting. All right, so the next question is, we want to know how often are you getting outside with the stay-at-home order in place? I know I'm trying to be out as much as I possibly can. Jeff, what about you? Um, I've been, you know, my kids are at home right now, so um, trying to help them with, you know, seventh grade math I don't remember how to do and <laughs> things like that. We just recently got a new puppy, so we're, uh, it's a perfect time to kind of try and house break and crate train a puppy. All right. What about you, Todd? Yeah, I'm uh, working at the, the first grade uh, math level, so I can handle that so far um and um yeah just two two boys at home and trying to work from home um definitely keeping me occupied brian yeah i've got a kindergartner and second grader at home so <laughs> remote learning with them there's a there's a handful right there all right, there's the responses on that one. So not too many of you are wasting too much time on Netflix right now. Not that that's a bad thing. <laughs> Everybody's dying for something to do here. Right. <laughs> well, good. We will give you some good ideas. We will, we will. All right, now the final question. Um, this one, uh, you have to use your chat box. Um, so what we wanna know is what is the one positive thing that is coming from the stay at home order. So go to your chat box, type it in. We're gonna take a look at what everyone's saying. Again, what's the positive thing? Ah, less traffic, yeah. <laughs> More time with family, yes. Daily walks, bike rides, slowing down. Oh, learning how to make sourdough bread. Sweet. More time outdoors. Yes. Closet cleaning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. These awesome. are excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is really fun. And I'm just going to make and say this before we move on. I have no clue where those green lines came from on those slides and I'm not able to get rid of them, but I'm going to keep working as, as we keep going. Ah, no worries. Sorry right. about that, guys. <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Ashley. And then just right. once again, as um, the speakers are going through, feel free to drop questions in the chat pod. And when, if we get some time in between our um, presentations, then I will go ahead and ask our presenters some of those questions. 
All right, next slide. Okay, so tonight, um, where our objectives and purpose, this basically is why we do what we do. Um, we uh, want to help individuals and communities better prepare for, for uh, and live with fire. Uh, we want to reduce the loss of homes and infrastructure and property. We want to increase individual community and firefighter safety. And we really want to reduce catastrophic wildfire damage to forests, rangelands, and watersheds. So what we hope you learn tonight, um, the first presentation will be done by Ryan and he's going to talk about the fundamentals of fire behavior and the science behind fire and um, this is a really good foundation for us so um, you can understand the strategies that Jeff will be talking about um, and how they're based you know, science-based on um, the kinds of things that you can do around your home to improve your chances of surviving a wildfire. Um, and then Todd's going to talk about resources available uh, in our area and, and some websites available nationwide as well. And then we're going to ask you to think about what you want to do. What kind of action plans do you want to do? And we're going to talk a little bit about a prize, a contest that we're planning on having for the best fuels reduction mitigation project. Um, we really would like you to stay through the entire presentation and also complete the evaluation at the end. Um, there will be a link that, that you can, in the chat box, that you can do that evaluation. Um, and for everyone who does complete that evaluation, we're going to send you a free gift. So we really appreciate it because evaluations really help us improve um, on what we're doing and also address maybe some other topics that you'd like to hear more about. So um, with that, Ryan, take it away. All right, everybody. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the real basics of fire science and fire behavior. And uh, we'll start with the next slide. Oh, I should also mention before I get started, uh, I'll uh, try and be pretty brief about this sometimes. I uh, use some fire jargon that's really only understood by wildland firefighters. I'll try my best not to do that, but uh, if, I, if I say anything that you don't understand, uh, just type it down in the chat box and I'll have time at the end for questions. So um, I'll, I'll make time, answer whatever I, whatever I uh, botch here at the end. So anyway, I'm gonna cover the fire triangle, fire behavior triangle, we're going to talk a little bit about topography, uh, fire weather, fuel, uh, what the benefits are of prescribed fire and why we do it. And then I'm going to mention a little bit about how you can mitigate uh, fire behavior on your property. Next slide. Okay, here's the very basics of fire and firefighting. This is what we call the fire triangle. There's three sides to it. Heat, oxygen and fuel. Uh, when we get into firefighting, we try and take one of those three sides away. We can take heat away by putting water on a fire. We can take fuel away by physically removing the fuel with a chainsaw or ax or brush cutter. And uh, we can take oxygen away by throwing dirt on it, uh, using some sort of retardant or foam to uh, kind of snuff it out, take the oxygen away. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is what we call the fire behavior triangle. And these three factors are what uh, are, are the three uh, number one contributors of extreme fire behavior or, or high fire danger you might see on the, on the DNR signs. Uh, topography, fire weather, and fuels. And I'll go into detail on each one of these starting with uh, topography. If we can go to the next slide. Okay, we don't see it so much in Minnesota. This is more something that you'd see in uh, more mountainous areas. But topography is always what we would call somewhat of a watch out situation. Uh, if a fire starts at the bottom of a hill, it wants to burn up the hill. And as it's burning up, it's doing what we call preheating that fuel above it. Uh, so if you have a fire burning down on the bottom third of the slope, 
It's going to burn more intensely in the middle third of the slope and even more intensely in the top third of the slope because that fuel is all being preheated. It's being dried and cured as that fire burns. Uh, another consideration that we, uh, we always take into account when we're dealing with topography is uh, if you can see on the picture on the left there, uh, burning debris rolling down slope, we call those rollers. And I've seen, uh, I've seen rollers roll maybe 3,000 feet down. Uh, I can think of one time in particular on the Salmon, Salmon River in Idaho. Uh, a log fell down about 3,000 feet from ridge top all the way down to the Salmon River and started a fire down at the bottom. And that fire uh, went from the bottom to the top then. So just one thing that we I always want to take into consideration when we're talking about topography. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, fire weather. This is the most variable of our, our three sides of the fire behavior triangle because uh, this stuff changes every day. The ones that we really want to focus on are temperature, relative humidity, and wind. Uh, we're all familiar with temperature, just how hot or cold the air is. Relative humidity. If we're not familiar with that, that's a measure of the saturation or the moisture in the atmosphere. So 100% relative humidity means that you're getting rain and 1% uh, or I suppose, I don't think technically it can go down to 0%, but 1% would be desert type dry stuff, middle of the day, uh, July type conditions. Uh, wind. That's the number one driver of fires in, uh, in Minnesota and in most of the flat areas. Topography would probably be more of a driver in the, in the mountains, but uh, wind is our number one driver of fires here. Uh, our trigger points or watchouts uh, when it comes to these three in Minnesota are 80, 20, 20. Anytime we have a temperature over 80 degrees, that uh, tells me that we could see extreme fire behavior, relative humidity under 20%. That's also a fire day. And winds over 20 miles an hour. Uh, those, those three are all would contribute to extreme fire behavior. So temp 80 degrees, relative humidity 20, winds 20 miles per hour. Uh, precipitation. That's you all, you all know what precipitation is. That's really hit or miss. What we go by in the fire world is a tenth of an inch. That's what we call a wetting rain. If we can get a tenth of an inch, that would probably take us out of extreme fire behavior at least for a day, depending on what sort of fuels we're dealing with. And I'll get into fuels on the next slide. Okay, this is the one that we have the most control over. Uh, the three topics that I'd like to hit when it comes to fuel is fuel loading, continuity, and the size and the shape of the fuel. Uh, and what I mean by fuel is just the vegetation. It can be living, dead, anything that the fire is going to burn. We'll start uh, with the next slide. This is extreme fuel loading. This is a picture from uh, the 99 blowdown on the Superior National Forest. I, I believe this is in the Boundary Waters. Uh, but this is heavy, heavy fuel loading. This is a lot of receptive fuel for a fire to get into. If a fire did get in there, it would be uh, very volatile. It'd be, we'd definitely see extreme fire behavior with fuel loading like this. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, this is heavy fuel loading, but it's vertical. So this is what we would call ladder fuels, like you're climbing a ladder. This is where your fire is gonna move from the ground up to an aerial fire or a canopy fire. And we can always, we can always work with ground fires, but once it gets up into the air, once it, gets into, uh, once it turns into a canopy fire, that's when we start to become ineffective as firefighters. So what we would want to do is re reduce these ladder fuels. Now the ladder fuels are all this brush that's four, six, eight foot tall. Uh, like, I, like I stated earlier, that's going to move the fire from the ground up to the air. So let's go to the next slide and see what uh, a nice stand without ladder fuels looks like. There, that's a 
I can't tell if that's a red pine or a ponderosa pine stand, but uh, that's, a, that's a really fire resistant stand right there. Uh, there's not much ladder fuels. The fire might be able to burn some of those younger pines, but uh, it's not gonna be able to move it from the ground up into the canopy. Uh, this slide also, also shows really nice breaks in the fire. So you're not seeing that 100% uh, continuity. If we can spread our fuels out and not have them all kind of stacked on top of each other, that's gonna be a much more fire resistant landscape. Uh, next slide. Now why that's important uh, in looking at it from a wildland, fire, a wildland firefighter point of view uh, is to protect your home. You can see the home on the right has been burned around. Looks like it was successfully burned around. Uh, no damage to the home that I see. I, that's probably because there was no fuel around the home. If you look at the home on the left, I don't think we would be able to burn around that without losing the home. And uh, when when we're in those tough situations, a lot of time a lot of time we're we're short on resources and short on time when a fire is moving through an area. So sometimes we just have to go up to a house and say, no, this is going to take too long to prep. We have to leave it. Um, it's I hate to say that, but that's just kind of the fact. Uh, the fact of it. Uh, a lot of times we we just don't have the resources to save all the homes. So if you as a homeowner can get in there and mitigate some of that fuel around your home, that's going to help us a lot as a wildland firefighter. Next slide. Now I'd like to end with a little bit about why we do prescribed burning. Um, most of the government agencies, government, state, and federal agencies will do some sort of prescribed burning. Now, the main reasons are to reduce fuel loading, encourage new growth, and uh, there are fire dependent habitats like jack pine in Minnesota or ponderosa pine out west that need fire to regenerate. Um, around here, most of it is done to reduce fuel loading. And uh, I'll, I'll clarify fuel loading a little bit. As forests start to become decadent and, and die off, uh, you get all that dead and down on the forest floor. And as that builds up, that's extreme fuel loading. That, that's a big contributor to extreme fire behavior. So if we can mitigate that with prescribed burns, uh, when the weather is in our favor, that's, that's probably our number one goal of prescribed burns. And let's uh, finish up with the last slide here. Okay, this is a great example of what you could do as a homeowner, what we do uh, in, in our agencies. This would be cut and pile. Uh, you can see somebody's gone in there and cut all the ladder fuels out, cut, cut a lot of the brush out. This, and then they'll come back and burn these piles maybe in the, uh, in the winter time, spring, fall, when the weather conditions are right to burn without, uh, without worrying about anything spreading. Um, and you can see after they burn those piles, this will be a nice, healthy, fire resistant stand. So there's, there's no way for fire to go from the ground into, into the canopies in this stand. Uh, that's all that I have for my slides. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, Ryan, we actually have one great question that follows up nicely with what you just said. So Trisha asked, since many of us have dead balsam and spruce right now uh, with the spruce budworm, is it better to cut the tree down and leave it on the ground or is it better to leave it standing dead? So they know that eventually it's best to get it chipped and disposed of properly. But in the meantime, should they put that dead tree down or just leave it standing? Hmm. That's a, that is a pretty interesting question. Uh, I would, I would probably put it on the ground and try and lay it flat to the ground. So, uh, cut it down and take the limbs off so it's laying flat on the ground. The the spruce budworm around here really has decimated a lot of the balsam and it doesn't take them long to fall down on their own, break off halfway up and then you have a real mess. So I think the best practice for that would be get it on the ground, limb it up and make it lay flat on the ground the best you can. Unless you have the opportunity to pile and burn it, that, that would be 
best way to mitigate that? Yeah, so getting rid of that ladder fuel is probably a priority then. And then um, one more question. So, yeah. And please, if you, anybody else has questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat pod and we'll save them and Ryan can get back to you with those answers. We just wanna make sure we stay on our, our schedule for this evening. But John is asking, what's the advantage of covering those brush piles with that plastic that's indicated in this picture? Uh, that's a great question. We, uh, we do that because sometimes these brush piles will sit for a year, a year and a half as they cure out. Uh, so we put plastic or sometimes tarp, paper, anything really to uh, uh, just keep a dry spot. So we'll come back in the wintertime and uh, put a drip torch right underneath that plastic where we have some, some dry fuel. And then as that burns, the residual heat kind of cures the rest of the pile. So it'll help melt off any snow or, or steam out any moisture that's in there and uh, hopefully burn the pile up nice. Excellent. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead and now we'll be turning it over to Jeff Jackson. All right, everyone. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is um, trying to show folks how to uh, create kind of what we call a firewise uh, property or firewising your property. Sometimes we use the word firewise as a verb. And uh, what we're going to look at here is um, uh, kind of a down and dirty um, start to finish uh, idea of uh, what things that you can do at your house that uh, may or may not make a difference. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so these three factors are, are going to be what we look at. We're going to look at uh, the access. Um, to your home, uh, like getting in and out of your property, uh, moving around your property. We're going to look at the uh, site factors of your property. Um, this has a lot to do with uh, topography and uh, fuels, um, some things that Ryan had talked about. And lastly, we'll be looking at the structure of uh, the um, buildings on your property and uh, the uh, grounds that make up your property. Next slide. Okay, so. Uh, like Gloria said, a lot of times uh, in the past, what we've done is we've, we start this type of presentation or kind of workshop at someone's house. So what I want everyone to do is just kind of imagine we're standing on the street that uh, is right in front of your driveway, and we're going to begin walking down your driveway now. Um, when we talk about access, we're talking about things like um, can firefighters and their vehicles get down your driveway? Can they move around uh, with their vehicles once they uh, actually get to uh, your house or your structure. Um, we're talking about things like, uh, if you notice up on the right, there is a gated um, uh, entrance there. Uh, does the fire department have uh, keys or accommodations to that? Um, do possibly your neighbors uh, have that? How often uh, is this gated? Is it only gated when you're not there? So um, there's a lot of different questions uh, that we're going to um, look at uh, regarding access. Let's move to the next slide. Okay, first thing, and this is something that a lot of people overlook, is signage. Um, if firefighters and their vehicles don't know where your property is, they're not going to be able to get in there to defend it. Uh, so uh, signage is a, is a huge deal um, when it comes to the access issues. Let's talk about the sign on the right. Uh, this is a great sign. If you notice, it is perpendicular to the road, so it can be seen from both directions large uh, reflectorized letters. Um, the reflectorization on the, the letters is good because a lot of time with smoke uh, going over the roads, a lot of fire vehicles, their lights come on automatically and um, the reflector on the signs will pick up that light and, uh, and shine back pretty good, letting you know that you are approaching a sign. Uh, the one on the left um, it has room for improvement. Uh, what I can see right here is it's pushed too far back into the brush and it appears to be parallel to the road. While yes, you can see it from the road, you can only see it from a very brief window as you're tri uh, traveling back and, and forth. And um, depending on where that brush is, it either needs to be cut back or the sign needs to be moved forward. And you want to, your sign as close to the road as you can get it. You need to check with your, your township or your city or whatever uh, municipality governs uh, how close things like this can be to the road and, uh, and check with them to make sure that you're um, within uh, code and you're not violating any of uh, the existing rules about uh, erecting signs on their roadways. Okay, let's move to the next one. Okay, so 
driveways. This is a this is the, the biggest issue with it when it comes to access. What I see here is a driveway that is very unappealing to firefighters and or their vehicles. What you really want to do when you're doing this kind of work around your house is you want to think like a fire truck. You want to make your driveway and your property as appealing to a fire truck as possible. You want to make a fire truck and its occupants say, hey, we can go down there. That, that's no problem. I'm not worried about going down there. What I see here is uh, a, an extremely crowded driveway. Uh, doesn't look very wide. I would be very nervous taking a truck down there, especially like a type four engine like we saw um, a few slides ago. Um, because I don't know if it's if I'm going to get stuck. Is there branches laying across the road? Is there something that could possibly uh, hit the light bars on my truck and uh, do some damage? And the other big thing I can I can see here is I don't know where this curves. I don't know if it curves to the right. I don't know if it curves to the left. Um, Brian was talking about you know the concept of triaging some houses, and we talked about that if you have you know a short period of time, two hours before a flame front rolls through, and you got time to look at 30 different houses you might only be able to help five of them uh with a little bit of work this driveway right here it doesn't matter how great your property looks i can't see it i would never go down this driveway if i had uh, uh time as a factor in in trying to triage some places i would drive right past this and go to some other we're a little late for this show that we signed up for oh well we're glad to have you and uh, so moving on, um, the uh, a driveway like this needs a little bit of work. Now we're going to see in the next slide, you want to move to the next one? Okay, this is a great driveway. This has a nice wide travel pad on it. Um, we're looking at about 15 feet wide. Uh, vegetation is cleared out of this 15 by 15 corridor. That's big enough for um, almost any type of uh, emergency vehicle to get down there. Uh, you know, it's the curves are uh, gentler than the last slide, um, and you're going to be able to uh, move down this without much uh, problems. And you, you would be even at this point, even if you weren't sure about what's at the end of this driveway, you could back down this and still back down it probably pretty quick uh, because of just how open it is. Always remember um, just kind of this 15 by 15 box is a, is a great um, kind of uh, measuring tool and uh, metric to use for how big you want your driveway. All right, let's move to the next slide. Okay, so it's curves and turnarounds. So let's just imagine that on that last slide, we decided to go down there and we drove and we got to this place and we're looking at, um, let's see if I can get rid of this little box here. Uh, nope. Okay. so. Uh, and we end up down uh, at this property. What I see here is um, a pretty decent turnaround here. You know, most fire vehicles would be able to come down here and do a three or a five or a seven point turnaround. You're not gonna have um, issues of somebody uh, getting stuck in between trees or possibly uh, their wheels going off into softer ground and getting stuck. And um, this is a place where a lot of firefighters would come down and immediately turn their vehicles around so they are ready to bug out really quick if they need to. Uh, this is a, a, an excellent turnaround. Most vehicles and most firefighters uh, would have the ability and the skills to, to turn around in here. What you don't want is you don't want a, a driveway like we saw, the bad driveway, that just dead ends at the door at a place like this. There's almost no place to turn around like that. And uh, if you do have a place like that, that doesn't mean you need to create what we're seeing here, but you could help out uh, the firefighters by creating a little 90 degree turnoff that would allow them to back into or nose into and be able to turn around. And it doesn't need to be uh, concrete. It doesn't need to be class five gravel like this. Um, it could just be something cleared of enough brush that uh, um, uh, off-road tires could get on and get off and, and turn around. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, now we're gonna talk about sight uh, and sight factors. Um, this is uh, probably the bigger issue than, than getting in and out of your property. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, what exactly is going on in the 100 feet around your property? Uh, what exactly um, are we looking at as far as uh, fuels and structure and uh, 
topography and aspect. And you might hear the term aspect. That aspect means um, what direction your slope faces. So um, if you hear that term, that's what I'm talking about. All right, let's move on. So, okay, we're gonna take a minute and uh, look at this graphic here. This is FireWise in a nutshell. Um, there's kind of three zones uh, we look at. We look at uh, the first five feet around your house. And um, then we're gonna look at up to 30 feet out from your house. And then to a lesser extent, we're gonna look at uh, that third zone from about 30 to 100 feet out. So the, the idea is, is basically um, this. In that first five foot zone, you don't want anything that could catch and support a flame. And uh, in a couple slides, we're gonna um, talk about um, some firebrands and embers that cause these types of uh, structures to ignite. In the next uh, zone that um, out to 30 feet, we want to eliminate a lot of the ladder fuels uh, if there are any present that Ryan was talking about. And we'll talk about a couple other uh, strategies that uh, you can take to kind of fire harden that area. And in that greater uh, zone, we're gonna talk about um, doing some work which could also eliminate ladder fuels making kind of some natural fuel breaks and uh, uh, working on uh, fire hardening that area uh, one thing to be cautious of is um, a hundred foot circle around something is that's a pretty big hunk of real estate there uh, there's a lot of work to be done uh, usually in that 30 to 100 foot zone and it can be uh, very intimidating uh, to to try and think about uh, doing all that work um, don't let it intimidate you. Start with the first zones closest to your house, and then as uh, you harden those zones up, then you can start to move out to that third zone. All right, let's move to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to watch a video in a second. I want to introduce this real quick. Uh, we used to have this idea years ago that a solid wall of fire was coming towards us, and we were going to have a... Um, uh, have it touch structures and burn the structures. Well, through research, we discovered that a solid wall of fire coming into an area with structures isn't what burns structures. What burns structures is the giant ember shower and firebrands that come out ahead of a fire. They get kicked out by the main fire, the fire front pushes them forward, and each one of those little sparks, all it has to do is land in a receptive fuel bed. And a receptive fuel bed is fuel that is ready to burn. Uh, that might be in your gutters, it could be next to your house. So we're gonna watch this and I'm gonna kind of talk over it a little bit. So I believe this is, uh, uh, I think it might be hay and steel wool they're actually blowing on that. Um, what you're gonna see is on this house right here. So watch, what do we see here? Boom, there's the first flame. The first flame is in the gutter. That gutter is packed with dry pine needles. Okay, there's a second and third flame. We start to see that right next to the house in the mulch, dry mulch. It doesn't even have to be completely dry to start burning. Mulch is extremely flammable. Uh, so what they did was they packed a lot of these areas with uh, the type of um, needles and leaves that you would see. Uh, as you can see that uh, the gutter is starting to melt. It's then dropped more fire into the mulch next to the house. Uh, you're seeing the asphalt shingles start to ignite now. And as this progresses, we're gonna see uh, the, the fire just continue to spread. And like Ryan was saying, it's going up hills. You can see it's moving up to the top of that roof. It's moving um, from uh, the low parts of the wall to the higher parts. And you start to see that corner actually gets really engulfed. On that roof, uh, we generally consider a house beyond uh, savable when we get about 25% of the roof is involved. Uh, that's when we would step back and say, as a wildland firefighters, probably not a whole lot we're going to do. That's more of a structure firefighting uh, scenario at that point. And here's a good, as you can see how that fire really builds in intensities. It's starting to swirl. It's starting to get hot. It's starting to pull the smoke in from all directions. And uh, you're getting um, very intense fire right here. That's preheating the fuels above in the upper part of the roof. It's... Uh, it's continuing to ignite all the grass that's in the all the grass and needles that are in the gutters. And in here, we're going to see um, kind of what the different siding will do to a house. Uh, this, is, this is a pretty good narrative here. On the right, you have vinyl siding. The vinyl is melting and uh, is burning somewhat, but sometimes 
it smolders. If you do not have direct flame on it, sometimes it doesn't continue to combust. Um, wood uh, will, once it gets going, it's just gonna keep going. And even when you take the flame away, it's still gonna go. Now here's a great piece of video here. A lot of people don't uh, realize this, but what you see here is uh, you're gonna see sparks coming in an attic vent. If you look up top there, when you have a wildfire, you create a temperature gradient uh, between the outside atmosphere and the inside of the home. That creates a vacuum. That vacuum starts to suck in embers that are already being driven in by, by wind. Uh, a lot of times those embers can find um, older insulation and uh, you can start um, to get flame actually inside the roof. Here we have an instance of uh, probably fiberglass screening and not metal screening uh, broke right through and starting to deposit firebrands and embers into the home. And that is it for the video. Let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, and I do have just a couple questions as we get those slides loaded. Sure. Um, so back to the signage um, piece, yeah. is, is there a universal kind of like suggestion for signs, um, especially maybe when there's multiple driveways or multiple properties back at the end of the driveway? And this might, question might be better addressed um, later because I don't know how specific it is that's a great, great question. Um, Everybody is a little bit different. Call your county's emergency manager. Call the emergency management department. Tell them you are interested in getting a new 911 side and you want to know what the specs are. Um, most places are, are, I would say, I've been all over and, and they seem to be pretty similar, but some places have a different color scheme um, that they want uh, planned. And then the other question was just related to the um, three or five point turnaround and um, actually yeah. some, some friendly people went ahead and helped to answer that question. But basically it just means how many times you got to pull forward and back up <laughs> before yeah. you can get yourself turned around. Have you ever tried to do a U-turn in a road and you don't quite make it and you're, oh, and you're going to hit the curve and you back up a little bit and then you got enough room? That would be a three point turnaround. If you have to do that twice, that would be a five point turnaround. I've turned around in driveways that were probably nine or 11 point turnarounds and we were lucky that we didn't get wedged between the house and trees. And that's all for now. So go ahead and okay. keep, keep on going, Jeff, thanks. All right, perfect. So um, back to the concept of ladder fuels. We're gonna talk about, uh, we're back in the 30 feet around your house uh, area now. Um, we often fight uh, in the, the firewising world, we often fight the idea that we want you to cut all the trees down around your homes. That's, that we, it couldn't be further from the truth. You can leave a lot of the trees, most of the trees up on your property if you're just willing to do a little bit of cutting and limbing on them. Um, if you look at the center picture, it shows about six feet up with the double arrows. If you can cut uh, and limb up your trees till the branch tips are about six feet off the ground, then any fire that might happen in your grass isn't going to ignite uh, the branches above it. And um, we're gonna talk about um, some tree spacing and uh, kind of density in the next slide. But uh, wh what you notice here is um, a picture on the left uh, might be, you might have a group of let's say six or eight trees in your uh, yard within that 30 foot zone. They're all conifer trees, which is the fuel we're talking about in Minnesota and most other places. We're talking about needle bearing trees, your pines, spruces, firs, cedars, um, you may have a larger group of trees that you don't want to uh, cut down to make a fire safe. If you can go in there and limb all those up and uh, take away those ladder fuels, it might just be perfectly safe. Now, sometimes those areas uh, are really, really dense uh, with, with trees. You might have an area that has 10 or 15 trees in it. Let's go ahead and, um, oh, wait a minute, let's not move to the next slide. The, the lower right-hand slide shows all of those pine trees um, and conifer trees, you know, the first couple are birch, uh, they're all limbed up. You can see that there isn't um, limbs touching the ground. So even if there was long, dry, dead grass or even pine needles within that area, it would be pretty hard to ignite the canopies of the trees um, above them. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so let's picture getting into a group of trees and looking straight up. Here's what we're looking at. What I see is a bunch of conifer trees. These are probably balsam fir and uh, in pines. And what you see is all the canopies are interlaced. They're all touching each other. They're all kind of growing together. If you got fire in one of those trees, you got fire in all of those trees. So 
if you can get into an area, look up like this and just kind of imagine it by removing a couple trees, you know, in your mind, take out a couple trees and say, what would that look like if I took this one, this one, and this one out? And okay, does that break up the canopies anymore? Are the trees still touching? And let's go to the next slide. And eventually you want to end up with something like this. Uh, these trees are spaced well enough where if one caught on fire, if it wasn't driven by a horribly fast wind, it might not catch the other one on, on fire. So, uh, you know, what we're looking at in that 30 foot zone, you know, limbing up your trees and uh, thinning out any trees um, that are, they have really, really closed canopies and, uh, and moving on from there. Can you do the next slide? Okay, tree spacing. So Ryan had talked about this earlier. Uh, live fuel and dead fuel are, uh, can be ladder fuels. What you see over there, those small balsam trees, balsam fir and a lot of uh, conifers will burn just as well when they're dead as when they're uh, living. In some instances, they burn even better when they're living. Um, what we recommend is removing any conifers six inches and under in that 30 foot zone uh, around your house and especially in that 100 foot zone as, as you um, progress further. So if you can look at the picture on the right now, that's kind of what the area on the left would look like as you went and um, and thinned out the, uh, the live ladder fuels and limbed up the branches. Again, you can see there's uh, fuel on the ground, but the chances of it igniting anything um, are getting smaller and smaller with each piece of fuel that we remove. Let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so cleaning up the home ignition zone. Um, a lot of times when, when firefighters get to an area, if we are going to uh, you know triage a place, we might only have 10, 15 minutes to spend at this house. And the firefighters might do things like uh, take the, the last hundred pieces of wood that's stacked by your house and chuck it as far as they can, throw out your lawn furniture away from your house, anything that can burn. What I see here is a structure that, um, while it doesn't have tons of uh, vegetative material around it, it has tons of other fuel around it. We, uh, there's a truck that can burn. Once that grass starts to ignite those old truck tires, it's gonna ignite that bed. It's gonna ignite everything in the back of the bed of that truck. You have probably an old lean-to or an old, uh, you know, um, fire shed on the side. That's basically just a, a stack of, it's an unburned bonfire laying right up next to, to a building. Uh, this is all stuff that you have to consider uh, in that 30 foot zone because not all of your fuel is going to be typical wildland fuels. Uh, the, the lawn uh, furniture that, that, that you see at the bottom there, all that uh, could easily uh, ignite if uh, sparks were to land on it. Um, it's something to consider. I often uh, tell people when I do see lawn furniture like this um, to uh, just consider all metal furniture. Uh, the, the cushions are easy uh, to remove. They can, they can be tossed off um, or uh, thrown in the garage by uh, wildland firefighters that are there uh, triaging your place. And also, uh, this is a good uh, chance to point out here that, that the tree on the left, it looks like it could, you could probably remove the next two rows of branches and then you would probably have that six foot, that six foot clearance um, up there. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, here's, this is one of our, this is one of our big three. We got, we got three kind of issues that we deal with uh, that are, you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck as far as, uh, as uh, danger mitigation goes. Um, as you can imagine, this is not an ideal scenario. Uh, it, as much as you want to keep your firewood dry, you don't want to pack it underneath your wooden deck, uh, especially when your house is built at the top of a slope it wouldn't take but three or four embers to get nestled into the pile of, of firewood there and you that place is gonna go up uh, in, in no time. Um, what, uh, what one of the strategies are is a lot of people, um, especially full-time uh, residents uh, versus seasonal residences, a lot of people heat with wood in their home. They use wood um, fireplaces or stoves and they pile up. Six, uh, six cords of wood that they're gonna use all winter right next to their house so they can just reach out and grab it and you know maybe even reach a couple pieces with their socks on and not have to run out and get it. Um, that's fine during the winter, but the second it turns to uh, you know fire um, season, especially in Northern Minnesota, and you still have that two cords left by your house, you're looking at a huge danger. 
the, the basic recommendation is get that wood out of that 30 foot zone. Um, there's no place within that 30 foot zone that it's uh, safe to stack that wood. Because even if you had it on the edge, if you've got three cords of seasoned firewood that goes up, uh, it's gonna put off a ton of heat and it's uh, going to threaten your structure. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And uh, if you can get uh, get some helpers to move that firewood, I think these are Todd's kids. We can move on. Okay, so here's the other. Uh, this is kind of part two of our of our um, big three that I talk about is uh, your gutters. Um, what every year you're going to get needle deposition and uh, leaves in uh, on your roof and, and in your gutter. Now, the problem with having uh, fuel in your gutter is um, since it's not on the ground, it's not going to stay wet. You know, anything that contacts mineral soil is going to wick up moisture and eventually start to break down any organic material. If you have this material laying in your gutter, it could be a, just a deluge of rain and uh, two hours later to a day later, that stuff's going to be ready to burn again. So you have to get up there. You have to clean that stuff out um, maybe once or twice a year. While you're up there, you might want to look at putting some type of screening on it uh, to keep that stuff out. Keep in mind, even if you have screening, all it's going to do is slow down stuff getting in there. You're still going to have to get in there at some point, maybe every couple of years then, and do that. But uh, the the real um, philosophy has started to, to shift here when it comes to gutters and wildland fire is you need to ask yourself, um, do you even need gutters? You know, what, what is the function of gutters? Well, they, they shunt off all the water that the roof intercepts and they move it away from your structure. So you don't have, um, you know, uh, water problems or foundation problems. Well, if your house is even at the top of a very, very slight hill, you generally don't need gutters. That that rain will run off that roof, hit the ground, and move away. Um, you should you can put rock, uh, river rock or decorative rock underneath your drip lines of your home, so it doesn't splash dirt on uh, your place. I've seen a lot of people um, very reluctant to remove um, problem gutters because they don't like all the dirt that gets splashed on to the side of their freshly painted white house. Um, a nice layer of rocks will, uh, will take care of that. Um, you want to cut and uh, rake the grass within, uh, the grass and, and the brush and pine needles within that 30 foot zone. Uh, a, a good thing to remember is uh, like short green grass is one of the worst enemies of wildfire. Nothing will stop a wildfire in its track like short green grass. So if you're keeping a decent lawn, if you're keeping short green grass within that 30 foot zone, if the majority of the square footage in there is short green grass, you're probably in pretty good shape. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so now is a good time to talk about um, roofs. There's two types of, uh, of uh, roofing material. Um, there is what we see here, which are asphalt shingles, uh, and there is uh, steel roofing. And we're gonna talk a little bit about both. Um, there's pros and cons of each. Asphalt shingles, um, if you've ever felt one, they feel like sandpaper. What you see there is all those needles have landed on that, that uh, roof. It's not a very steep slope, but it's holding all that debris on there. Uh, once it gets stacked up enough, it's going to start to move down into the gutters. If you had a steel roof, it would never build up like that because even a slight breeze would start to move it off. If given the chance, if you're looking at a re-roofing job, obviously if you can afford steel, that is the best way to go. It used to be a lot more cost prohibitive, it used to be more than twice uh, what a regular roof is. Now it has come down way, way down in price. Um, if you still aren't going to use steel, even a brand new set of uh, shingles is going to make a huge difference. Like the, it, the best shingles you could have bought 20 years ago pale in comparison to the cheapest stuff you could get today. Uh, they've come a, in the last 20 years a really, really long way in improving the um, uh, flammability ratings of uh, asphalt shingles and just throwing another layer over a degrading a degraded roof is uh, going to help um, way 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 more than than uh, not doing anything all right how are we doing on time pretty good Jeff you've got about good. 10 minutes before you need to all right that. perfect so here is uh, kind of the third of our of our big three here decks um, there's two types of decks here that, that I've, I've discovered. There's the decks uh, that you can see in front of you in the middle picture there. That's a deck that nobody wants to crawl under. That's a deck that you don't know what the heck's under there. There could be 
all kinds of stuff waiting waiting to crawl all over you or 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 spider webs to get in your face nobody wants to go under that uh, under a deck like that that being said you got to do it once if you're willing to go underneath there rake out any of dry accumulated uh leaves needles um animal bedding and you put uh, screening underneath there in the upper right corner you'll see that diamond plate screening and uh, it's kind of like hardware cloth it has quarter inch openings um, if you're willing to rake everything out and put that stuff down so that new material can't blow in and, and accumulate uh, it's going to make a huge difference you'll only need to do that uh, once and it doesn't even have to be attached or attached to the fascia on the, uh, the the deck there you can put it back underneath the post so it stays um, a little less visible um, putting uh, the wooden lattice that we see up in the right corner, um, even, uh, you know, a layer of, of uh, screening and then the lattice um, works really well and you really don't see the screening that much. In the lower right corner, what we see there is um, some uh, metal screening. I think it has uh, probably some very, very small perforations in it, almost like a soffit. Um, if th this is a great option if you're going to, uh, if that looks like maybe a three season porch or something like that, not only are you going to keep stuff uh, from accumulating in there that could burn, uh, you're going to improve the energy rating of, uh, of that portion of your house too if it's attached to um, any area that uh, is uh, already heated. Let's move on to the next one. So landscaping, uh, here's a good time to talk about this. Um, Landscaping makes a huge deal. Uh, you don't want a mulch right up next to your house. This is this is something that uh, we have fought for a long time because um, a lot of people will put mulch right up against your house because that's what landscapers landscapers have done for the last 50 years. Uh, mulch is pretty flammable. Even when it's wet, it's pretty flammable. And what happens in in mulch beds? Well, people uh, they plant. Um, uh, bushes and shrubs. And what we see here are extremely fire prone bushes and shrubs. I see some arborvitae, maybe a yew or a juniper, maybe even a mugo pine. These are all uh, very, very um, uh, volatile bushes. If you start to get um, sparks in and underneath uh, bushes like this, they're, they're going to go up. So I would recommend uh, having um, rock landscaping right up next to your, uh, to your home and planting um, native uh, landscaping materials that are much, much lower on the flammability uh, rating. Um, at the end of the presentation, we have a link to uh, a page that shows uh, naturally um, low flammable uh, landscaping materials and native vegetation. Um, so, you know, just, just re real quick, when, when we talk about it in Minnesota, we're, we're talking about fuel, I had mentioned it before, we're talking about um, conifers and, you know, kind of on the flammability scale, uh, you know, your, your firs are your worst, then your spruce, then your pines, and then your cedars. Uh, that is going to be um, kind of your one, two, three, and four of, of uh, how quickly those things will, uh, will burn. Um, fir being by far the worst. And uh, up in Northern Minnesota here, we ha currently I have a big uh, um, spruce budworm um, bug kill, which, you know, it's kind of a misnomer being spruce budworm. It, it seems to prefer balsam fir, but uh, it has just created um, just thousands of acres of standing ladder fuels. And uh, it's it can be pretty devastating once that stuff gets rolling. All right, what's the next one? Okay, so structure. Um, we're gonna go into, uh, you know, a, a little bit of um, what things are made of, how things are set up. Uh, you know, obviously uh, wooden siding uh, isn't the best. Um, if you can have some type of um, cement fiberboard siding, that's great. Uh, it, you know, even um, they make now metal um, aluminum siding that uh, looks uh, almost like like a wood shiplap siding. I've seen a couple newer constructions up in the Ely area that I had to go up and, and like tap on it with a pencil to even see that it, that it, it uh, wasn't wood. Let's go on to the next. Okay, so uh, real quickly, here's some of the things that you're gonna discover on your structure, which could be a problem. Uh, starting in the upper left, um, we're looking at uh, soffits here. Soffits are the uh, part of your roof that um, uh, your your roof is overhanging uh, the wall. In a lot of seasonal cabins, you might find off our um, open soffits uh, where people 
have actual open gaps in there that um, they're not really concerned about uh, having uh, airtight because they're not up there year round. They're only up there uh, during you know a, a comfortable season. You want to make sure that you have closed soffits. In the lower uh, left, we're going to see um, the uh, vent right there. That looks like the gable vent we saw that let in all the sparks. Uh, most cheaper gable vents have uh, um, fiberglass screening on them. Uh, if you're doing any type of work like this, buy a roll of uh, aluminum screening and um, tear the old fiber stuff out, fiberglass stuff out, and you can put on uh, the new metal screening with just even a couple dabs of caulking uh, but before you screw it on. It's going to make uh, a big difference. I've even seen people put um, two and three layers of it on there to make a, a, a uh, even a bigger difference. Uh, center picture, um, we see propane uh, tank right there. Um, the best thing I can tell you is remember a full propane tank is a safe propane tank. Uh, if you are keeping your propane tank full, uh, it doesn't change temperature that much um, in a wildfire setting and it's less life likely to um, uh, bleed off any pressure uh, and ignite. Don't plant things around your propane tank to hide it. Uh, that is how it gets to be out of sight, out of mind. I've seen some people that try to disguise it with uh, certain bushes and it gets so grown over that if there was a fire in there, uh, th there would be no way that tank um, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be involved. Um, keep the area clear around your tanks. Uh, on the, the lower left, we see uh, a, a chimney stack over there. What I see are spark arresters. This is a, this is a, a great thing to have um, on anything that is exiting your house that's carrying the exhaust of a wood stove or a fireplace. Um, the, the whole point of uh, a spark arrestor is that it takes larger sparks, runs them through a couple baffles, and then breaks them up uh, before they can come out that screen. And you're still going to get a spark or two that comes out, but they're going to be a lot smaller, they're going to be a lot more fragile, and they're going to go out um, within a relatively short time rather than travel like the fire brands that uh, we saw in the insurance uh, video that uh, was responsible for igniting that house on fire. And the uh, last thing um, on this slide is, see on the upper right, uh, those large windows. Um, a lot of times you get radiant heat that, that can come into a home. And in some instances with double pane windows, uh, there can be uh, kind of a, uh, an intensified uh, or reflective um, quality to those windows that uh, could ignite things inside the house with or without fracturing those windows. So some of the things you can do if you have really, really large windows like that is they do make uh, kind of um, some curtains that have a thermal backing to them that will uh, redirect a lot of uh, radiant heat. Next slide. And one of the last things I just wanna put a plug in for, smoke detectors. You know, uh, many wildfires have been discovered uh, from home smoke detectors. You know, you leave a window open, smoke comes in, sets off your, fire detector, you get up from where you're reading your book and oh my goodness, there's, a, there, there's an actual fire over there. Uh, a, a lot of times um, that's some of the first reports uh, we get are from smoke detectors. Now, replace your smoke detectors you have now. Most of them have 10 year sealed lithium batteries that you don't have to test twice a year. You don't have to buy the, the $6, uh, you know, nine volt battery that only seems to last a year. Um, and they're quite uh, they're quite cheap nowadays. I think you can you can pick these up at, at Home Depot for maybe fifteen dollars each, and uh, they usually will last for about ten years. Next slide. Well, that's that's all I got. Um, I wanted to leave some time for uh, any questions um, if, if folks had. Like I said, it's kind of a down and dirty uh, um, talk for what we normally would have done. Normally this type of thing would have taken us about uh, two hours to walk around someone's house and I would be doing some of the work and showing people um, a lot more specifics. But uh, this is uh, how we decided to, to do it in the, in the name of uh, working on our uh, social distancing that we all seem to have to deal with now. Yeah, Jeff, thank you. And I am gonna actually, we have time just for one question and it came in sure. early during your presentation. So before we um, jump over to the activity, Paul asked that he, or just mentioned, he's got property adjacent to the Superior National Forest. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, lot of balsam fir in that land. 
So is he allowed to thin those small firs, even if they're in the national forest, but within his 30 foot kind of protection zone? Um, no, at that point, the, I would say your, uh, the, the forest boundaries trump uh, any uh, of that 30 foot zone. Um, once you're on forest service land or any other private uh, land or essentially any land that isn't yours, whether it's county, um, federal, state, you need to check with the owner of, of that land and, and what it is you can do with it. Uh, the, a lot of the federal agencies have um, a fuel reduction plans uh, that they're working on on like 10 and 20 year cycles and that area around your home may be scheduled to be thinned or even have a prescribed burn done sometime around then. I would say stop into their local office, tell them about where you live, tell them about your concerns and uh, see what they say. And I'd also mention, I don't know if Gloria wants to jump in on this, but um, Dovetail Partners, uh, who Gloria works with, also has an agreement with the Forest Service to do some work with <laughs> landowners that have adjacent land to Forest Service property. And so um, I know that they're actively interested in working with those landowners. So that might also be a good connection um, Paul, to connect with Gloria on that issue because she helps try to organize some of those concerns with from adjacent properties. And Paul, if you're in Cook or Lake County, Todd also uh, uh, works like that as well. So we're not sure which county you're in, but um, either Todd or I can help you with that. So we appreciate the question. Um, so Jeff, that was great. Um, so I want all of you to think about um, some of the things that Jeff uh, you know, talked about in his presentation and think about your own yard or your own property and, and some of the things that you might want to do to reduce your wildfire risk. Um, one of the things that we talk about with people is that a lot of times when, when they're at these demonstrations, they get really overwhelmed about all the things that need to be done. And you know, we don't want that to happen. What we want you to do is, is just really um, think about a simple plan, a, a, an easy way to start. And again, you know, the biggest thing that we ask people to do is start in that uh, zero to 30 foot zone. If you work a little bit out from there, that, that's, that's what we ask. So, but when you're starting to make a plan, we want you to keep your actions very specific I mean, be realistic um, on what you can achieve and also give yourself a timeline. Say, hey, this summer I'm going to work on 10 feet around my house, all the way around my house. Um, and, and that, you know, kind of helps and um, do a little bit at a time. I mean, you might just go out, you know, maybe in between, you know, fishing, you know, um, or swimming or something like that. Just just do a little bit at a time. But that that really you know, gets you motivated and anything you can do is going to help. So right now, our uh, last activity, we'd like you to um, think about what you'd like to do um, and write it in the chat box. We'll give you a couple minutes. Um, just think about some actions that you'd like to do. So uh, Gloria, I just wanted to say uh, real quick, if you take away three things from this, um, I want them to be those, those big three. Clean out your gutters, get rid of those firewood uh, next to your house, and um, rake out and screen underneath your decks. Uh, those three things are probably going to be the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to uh, firewising uh, your property. Nice. Oh, yeah. Move the wood pile. Yay. Move yeah. Pile. <laughs> you got it. Clear those lower branches. Trim around the fire pit, yeah. yeah. While people are typing these in, Gloria, I have a quick question and either you or Todd might be able to answer this. Um, so John asked, I see that the East Bearskin Brush Disposal Pit is now listed as requires permit. Do you know how to re um, obtain that kind of permit? Todd, I think that's in your uh, Yeah, that's, you know, that's been, um, that was kind of a holdover from um, years past. We haven't, um, we haven't required it in in the past several years. Um, we're just really want to make sure it's um, property owners that are local there, um, seasonal or local that are using that site because it's not a huge site and it, it does get a lot of use. But um, I think that was a um, some type of permitting rule in the past that um, 
we haven't used recently, so I could check into it further. But uh, if you're a, you know, if you're a property owner up there, you're um, free to take materials as long as they fit the um, description in the in the rules um, which are posted there. Uh, I also see in the chat box that someone asked um, who should they contact if they need work done on their home. Um, all of us do have lists of contractors um, that you can check out. We don't make recommendations for anybody. I mean, we will give you the list of contractors and we want you to take a look at them and, and, and you know, again, approach it as if you were doing any other, um, hiring any other contractor on your property, make sure they have insurance. Um, you can ask them to, for references, anything like that. But if you are interested in uh, contractors in your area, either give Todd or I a call and, and we can help you out with that. So we're still getting quite a good few good ideas of people, what they want to do to their properties to make it more resilient to wildfire. But I think it'd be good to maybe, because a lot of these questions are related to resources. Todd, why don't you go ahead and take over um, and uh, share some of that information with you. And I'll keep tracking all these questions because I do think we're gonna have some good time for Q&A at the very end. Okay, yeah, thanks, Ashley. So um, yeah, I just wanted to hit some additional information sources. Um, these are all listed in your um, resource folder that came with your registration uh, emails. You can get this list, don't feel like you have to write it down now, um, but there's a number of websites that are in that resource folder, um, these and several others. And you can go here for more specific information um, based on where you're located. Um, the Cook County um, website has a number of things that we talked about, like the contractor list um, and uh, several brochures and the disposal sites. Um, in that resource folder that uh, came with your registration, you'll also see that native tree and shrub brochure with the flammability ratings for different um, plant species in there. You can take a look at that if you're thinking of um, what, what you can plant around your home. And we also have a home evaluation form in there if you want to do a little walk around your house um, and kind of do a self-assessment, that'll walk you through the process and, and kind of let you know where your um, risk rating is sitting. And um, as I mentioned, the brush disposal sites, um, there's maps in there as well. So um, just quickly, the Cook County brush sites, um, there's seven of them throughout the county. And on our website, cookcountyfirewise.org, we do have um, a program in there. You type in your address and it'll tell you what the nearest uh, brush site is. So that's a handy resource to have. Um, Lake County, similar, um, seven sites available to take your material. Um, and we just ask you to, um, that it's from Firewise Activities and that you're following the rules on the, um, on the signs that are posted there. And we are working on getting um, a similar program up on the website for Lake County, which uh, hopefully will come this summer. And again, these are listed in your resource um, folder. And then St. Louis County has um, eight different brush disposal sites. They're located at the transfer stations that are um, spread throughout the county. So where you can take your um, your trash in the rural parts of the county, you can also drop brush there. So that is a handy thing to have. So um, I wanna propose um, a way for kind of us to work together and hopefully uh, maybe get your help from a few of you. So Gloria and I, um, we're looking for leaders kind of in each neighborhood or each lake association or road association. Um, help spread the word about um, wildfire resiliency, um, some of the things you learned today, and just someone to kind of help educate their neighbors, get them involved in, in some of these topics, um, and, you know, take steps to reduce risk on their property. Um, you know, the more, the more people that participate in these type of activities, the, the safer and more effective it is for the, for the neighborhood as a whole. So, um, 
you know, Gloria and I have a huge geographical area we cover. Um, we're funded by grants. And <clears throat> having that local um, contact person, kind of that local um, cheerleader in a way to um, get people motivated is, is key to um, getting some of these projects done. So um, we just ask that if you're interested in being a neighborhood ambassador, um, that you reach out to us based on where you're where you're located in the county. So, um, and we can help you plan projects. We can help get grant funding for projects. We can help with uh, reimbursements for um, contract work, et cetera. So this is just something we're trying to launch throughout the Arrowhead region. And um, we'd like you to participate if um, if you feel like that's something you would be interested in. We also have some uh, potentially some more upcoming training events for for those neighborhood ambassadors. And if they're similar to, you might say, I'm um, part of the Firewise community. It's it's uh, very similar um, where you're you're a leader of the Firewise USA site. Um, the neighborhood ambassador program just expands that concept a little bit and um, and it really works similar to to what you're doing in those Firewise USA sites now. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to try to have a little fun with this. I know, you know, we're just telling you to go out and do a bunch of yard work. Um, that doesn't necessarily excite people. Um, but to try and um, encourage folks and, and make it a little more fun, um, we want to have a friendly little competition for the best mitigation project this year. So, um, what we're hoping is that you'll take some of those ideas you had um, that you typed in the chat box and you'll email us a brief description of your project and like with a before and after photo and you can submit those um, up until October 31st of this year. And we will select a winner or multiple winners um, depending on you know what kind of participation we get and they'll receive a prize for, for their efforts. So um, if you want to get those um, descriptions and uh, photos to Gloria or myself um, at the email address that, that we have listed, we will put you in the running for the best mitigation project contest. And with that, I think we have um, a fair amount of time for questions. Uh, maybe a few minutes. I'll I'll let um, Ashley take it from here, so she can um, read the chat box, or if you want to unmute your microphone um, to ask a question for the group or for any uh, presenter individually. Yeah, we've got some good questions in the chat box too, so I'd love to um, make sure we tackle those um, first. I'm also just as a heads up, I'm going to be putting a link in the chat box right now which takes you to a Google form and that's our evaluation. Um, I would really appreciate, we would all really appreciate everyone just taking, it will, I promise, five minutes max to answer these questions just to help inform how we did and how we can improve in the future. So that link is getting dropped in the chat pod right now. So would love for, for folks to respond to that when you get the chance. Um, and that, that link will also get sent out in a follow-up email after the webinar um, is done. So one of the questions, and maybe this follows up with the answer you gave, Gloria, about um, reaching out to contractors to handle some of the trees. One of the questions was, is who could we contact to find out if anyone was interested in some of the large trees they need to remove? And I'm guessing maybe those same contractors may have some ideas on that. Yes, um, we had the list that we have of contractors. We're uh, we broke them down um, in into logging co uh, contractors who might be interested in actually um, using the lumber um, or you know small more handwork or dangerous trees. So the list that we have is not only by region but also um, what they prefer or the kind of equipment that they have to use. And so um, it is best to talk to the, the contractor to see if they are interested in your lumber. And then the next question, um, what should a firewood shed be made out of material-wise? Steel siding? 
Uh, yeah, st you know, steel siding uh, would be great. Um, one of the issues we run into there is, is you know, as nice it would be is to get it as tight as possible, your wood's not going to dry, uh, you know. So if, if you can, it's almost like you need sometimes uh, almost like a two-stage uh, woodshed system, one that's going to dry it uh, for a year and then one you can actually store it in. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, any way you could take and, and make a cube as airtight as possible to keep that, uh, that wood in, um, it's it's going to help. I've even seen people, uh, you know, do the top part of the walls with um, screening uh, so that it, it helps uh, prevent sparks from getting in, but still allows uh, moisture to come out when the wood is drying. Another question is someone has two big white pine trees next to their cabin, lots of needles. How often should those needles be removed? Once a year? Uh, they're going to, they're going to fall year round. Um, you know, even uh, needle bearing trees, you know, they, they will exchange their needles uh, sometimes, you know, every two to three years. So you're always going to be getting needles uh, dropping. I would say I would do it um, two to three times a year. Uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that it, it just really depends upon what types of trees you have that are putting needles on your roof. Some of them put needles faster than others. Uh, some of them you might only need to do once a year, but I would, I would always, uh, be checking my my head up there at least once a season. Another question, um, or maybe even more just a comment, is I think some people are recognizing how much work just needs to be done in their neighborhood as a whole. And so um, the comment was, I feel like we need a huge neighborhood effort. How do I get the neighbors on board? It's so labor intensive. And I think that this network or this neighborhood ambassador program that Gloria and Todd's working with is the answer to that, although it's just kind of getting started. Maybe you guys want to talk about that, that a little bit more. That's exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> so Todd and I would love to hear from you. Um, and, you know, we can, you know, no, you don't necessarily have to make a commitment to us right away. But if you want to hear more about some of the things that we've done to help other communities and motivate other communities, definitely give us a call. Um, we really would love to hear from you. And if I could just add to that, we, we have some um, grant funding available. You know, if we have a neighborhood that's interested and has a project and a need um, for work, um, you know, we have some grant funding help that we can often um, help with some of those costs, uh, depending on the project. And, um, you know, you can reach out to us for, for more on that as well. So. Another question, and I love this person's screen name, Addison's Gram and Pop. So we know somebody's been messaging their grandkids, um, but they are asking, do you have a Ready, Set, Go program? Mm. And are you meaning, do you have like a webinar training, um, Addison's Gram and Pop? Or maybe you can help me out, understand that a little bit better. And feel free to unmute yourself if you need to. Well, the Ready, Set, Go program, um, Ready, Set, Go program is an excellent program. Um, that is offered by the uh, Firefighters Association. And it really is something that I've been trying to encourage our fire chiefs to, to join up with um, because there is a lot of excellent material out there. But you can go on their website, just go on uh, Ready, Ready I, I believe it's ready.gov. And, um, and you can see all the information that they have. It's, it's similar to FireWise, but, but um, they have some excellent information for residents and for fire chiefs. Great, thanks. Um, next question, approximately what percentage of property owners in Cook County have outdoor sprinkler systems? It's an interesting one. <laughs> Um, I don't have a number. I know we had three different um, FEMA grants in years past that um, had cost share available for um, for installing wildfire sprinkler systems. I um, I believe there's at least 600 properties in Cook County that have them, uh, but I don't have an exact number on that. Great. A uh, question from Anna. Todd, is there a schedule for the Wicola brush reduction project? Um, let's see. I'm not sure exactly. Um, yeah, we're working on that project um, in Fall Lake Township, and 
um, we'll be reaching out to you if you if I haven't met with you yet. Um, we will be or we'll be reaching out to you by email. Um, if you were one of the folks who got in early on it, then um, we probably already have a contractor lined up and it's just a matter of getting them set up. So if you want to email me, um, you know, at uh, my Lake County Firewise um, email, I can get you a better answer for that. And we do have two comments, one from Jeff Willis, one from Paul Jacobson that are very interested in the Fire Ambassador program. So we'll make sure that Great. we get your contact information and have Todd and Gloria reach out. Um, and then I'm going to just add, do one last question. It's right at eight o'clock and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. But there was a good question from Beverly. If we trim up our conifers as suggested, su suggested <laughs> up to six foot, what does that do to the tree's health long term? Oh, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so if they're a larger tree, uh, it doesn't do anything to their to their health. You know, a, a tree in a forested setting like that would naturally be shedding those branches anyways, as those branches um, got less and less light as the canopy started to, to tighten. Um, when pruning a tree becomes a problem is when you're pruning off like more than half of the live crown. And um, if you have a tree that you want to prune up to six feet off the ground, but the tree is only 10 feet tall, that's going to be an issue. You might want to only start pruning it, uh, I would say, two feet up for the first couple of years and just really babying it and watching it and maybe the next year uh, pruning one more row of branches off and one more, but you never want to take more than half of the living crown off at any given time or else it's going to, um, it's not going to respond and it's probably going to stress it. If I could really briefly, um, it, you know, Pruning really helps um, with white pine blister rust. So if you yeah. have white pines, um, it's actually beneficial to um, prune those up following the, the guidance that Jeff said with the um, percentages you're taking off. But that would actually help them in the long term. And if anybody, um, I have a great publication uh, that the um, feds have put out for pruning uh, trees um, in, in regards to uh, uh, health and, and, um, and individual tree health. Uh, Shoot me a message and I'll mail it out to you. I got a stack of them sitting here on my desk that I would love to get rid of. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and close out the q and A. I don't know, Gloria, Todd, um, Ryan, and Jeff, we can maybe do the stop share on the screen. And if there's a few other people that have questions, we could um, continue to do that. But I wanna formally just kind of end the program here now that we're at the eight o'clock hour and just say that I really appreciate everyone's involvement and participation please go ahead and use that link to give us to do some survey um, responses so that we can improve and figure out how we can make these sessions better. Also remember that in that email you got with the Zoom link to participate today, there was also a link to a Google Drive folder with a lot of the resources that were mentioned today. Um, go ahead and get online and download all of those resources. So you have them on your own computer. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about how to access that, you can reach out to me. Um, but Gloria, do you want to do just kind of a final goodbye? And then maybe if some folks have some Q&A, they, they can hang on. Yeah, again, we just want to say thank you very, very much for sharing your evening with us. And um, if we can help you out or get you going in your communities, that's what we're here for. So we do want to hear from you. Todd, do you want to say anything? Um, yeah, I appreciate the turnout was excellent. We, um, we couldn't uh, be happier with all the folks that um, signed up and um, yeah, I'm happy to hear from you. I hope, uh, hope I hear from a lot of you and can help you out um, in any way. Thank you. Yeah, we had um, 58 participants for a majority of the presentation tonight, which is excellent. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. Great. So with that, if there's any lingering you know, questions out there, um, you can go ahead and drop them in the chat pod or unmute yourself. Um, and we might be able to address those in the last few minutes our speakers might have this evening. But if not, feel free to go ahead and sign off. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you, nice job. Thanks very much, great job. Have a great evening. Nice work, Gloria, Todd, and Ashley. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Annie. <laughs> well done.
I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.